Our speaker this evening is Deborah Corbett, whose obsession with the Aleutian Islands began in high school. She has experienced Alaska in many ways throughout her career. Tonight, she will teach us about the symbolic meaning of birds to the Unangan Inuit people. Deborah, welcome. Thank you, I'm really excited. Yeah. <laughs> now we just need to get the slideshow up. Yep, and I will stay on in case you need any help. There it is. There it is. Awesome. Okay. Um, like Becky said, I've um, been an archaeologist for a long time. I started work in 1980, and I started working in Alaska in 1983. And that year, um, I came to Alaska to work for the Bureau of Indian Affairs, um, investigating historic and cemetery sites for the Bureau of Indian Affairs uh, land claims. And they sent uh, me with a crew well, there were two crews of seven or eight people each to the Aleutians. They gave each of our crews a boat um, and told us we would be dead in a month. Um, we had a wonderful time and I've been obsessed with the Aleutians ever since. Uh, one of my mentors who was my boss that first year, um, Bill Shepard for the one person in the audience who also knew him, told me that archaeology uh, basically could only say people lived here and they ate food. I protested because I was young and idealistic and I've spent a lot of time since then trying to prove him wrong. Um, it helped being in Alaska where the native cultures are still very close to their um, traditional way of life, um, traditions living off the land, they're living in their traditional territories and um, much closer to their ancestral traditions than a lot of native people in other, other places. The, the distant past and recent past uh, meld together with modern life in, in a lot of Alaska. <clears throat> this is kind of a long way of saying that I began to search for deeper meaning uh, from the archeological remains that we were finding, um, basically scraps and detritus from, from old villages. Um, my particular obsession is the history and culture of the Unungan Aleuts. They're, uh, they're not actually Inuits, they're Aleuts. Uh, it's a distinct group. They're not Eskimos, they're not Indians, they're not anything but Aleuts, and they actually have a, a few unique uh, DNA snippets um, that are that mark them as Aleuts. Uh, they lived in the Aleutian Islands from the base of the Alaska Peninsula uh, all the way to Attu. Um, on Alaska is on uh, uh, Dutch Harbor, uh, is on uh, an Alaska Island, is about a thousand miles from Anchorage, and Attu Island is about a thousand miles from uh, an Alaska. So we're talking about a, an absolutely huge area. Um, the Aleutian Islands are made up of about 200 volcanic islands um, that separate the, the North Pacific from uh, <clears throat> the Bering Sea. Um, I threw in bird pictures because I knew you'd be interested in birds. Uh, there are some of my favorites. The uh, um, Now I can't even remember what the little ones in the bottom left are. The Lapland longspur in the front, in the top. This is an incredibly rich environment um, and far from the mainland of Alaska. And it meant that the um, Aleuts were totally reliant on the sea for uh, their livelihood. They, uh, there are no trees, they, they wood came from driftwood and all of their food and um, material needs came from the ocean. One friend called it the most thoroughgoing marine adaptation anywhere in the world for human beings. 
the Yunangan are classified by anthropologists as hunter-gatherers. They make their living harvesting wild resources. The diet was largely sea mammal meat and oil and fish. This fish and meat diet was supplemented by small game, which in the Aleutians means birds, and some plants, mainly berries. They also harvested um, enormous quantities of grass for basketry, matting, um, thatching for their houses, et cetera, et cetera. All cultures are complex, but the rich environment of the Aleutians allowed the Yunangan to create a culture with traits that uh, Euro-Americans typically consider the province of agricultural societies. They lived in large permanent villages. Some of these had six, 700 people in them. Um, they had a ranked society with hereditary chiefs, commoners, and um, class of slaves, which were usually um, prisoners of war, or the um, um, class of people that were uh, called um, kinless Aleuts. They didn't have relatives to support them, and they were reliant upon um, the generosity of their neighbors. They had a very sophisticated toolkit made with um, a lot of bone and stone, um, driftwood, uh, complex artistic traditions, and elaborate ceremonial practices. Birds were materially important. Because they're smaller than sea mammals, birds were only a minor component of the diet. But the migratory birds that showed up in the spring were it, were critical. Um, they were the first fresh food to arrive after a winter spent eating um, dried and fermented fish and sea mammals. Um, and food was often very scarce by, by May when the, the migratory birds started showing up. Um, they also provided much welcome variety. Um, uh, sea lion and fish get old fast. And um, eggs were gathered in their thousands when they were available in the spring. And, and that was a uh, picture on the right there. Um, a, a manly deed of daring do to collect eggs from those cliff nesting seabirds. Bird bones were used for tools. Um, including awls for piercing leather, leather chisels for word working, sewing needles, and my favorite um, bone fish hooks. I'm working on a book about Lucian archaeology and in the process have learned more about fish hooks than I ever thought possible. Aleut's used um, a composite. Every aspect of a fish hook is a, has a function in catching fish, everything, the bend, the straightness of the hook, everything has something to do with how you catch a fish. Um, Alleys used a composite hook made of two parts, the hook and the shank, both of bone and usually bird bone. Um, hook characteristics target specific sizes and types of fish in specific water conditions. These styles, you see the barbing on the, um, the hook points, um, those are unique to different island groups and to different time periods. So the, the style and design of the fish hooks also acted as ethnic markers and distinguished um, socio-political groups from each other. Bird skins were used as clothing for men. Women wore parkas of sea otter or fur seal furs. The skins were usually worn uh, feather side in uh, for warmth. Um, the outsides were stunningly decorated with um, embroidery and um, tassels and attachments of fur and hair and um, uh, bird beaks. They, they were just stunningly decorated. I'm constantly amazed that Aleut women um, had the time to create all this clothing um, in addition to everything else they had to do with processing food, catching food, um, raising kids, um, keeping the house warm, everything. They, uh, even ordinary daily clothing was stunningly decorated. 
Um, skins actually may have been one of the main reasons for hunting birds because they are so small and they often targeted um, even smaller kinds of birds like the whisk whiskered and crested auklets for the decorative feathers um, that were used to um, decorate the, the clothing too. We find a lot of bird bones in archeological sites and a lot of the bones show butchering marks that indicate that the um, birds were being caught for skins. You'll get scalp marks around the beaks on the heads where the skin was then pulled off over the, um, the head of the bird. And they would um, pull, pull these nesting seabirds out, these poor puffins out of their nests. And instead of puncturing their skins with um, tools, they would bite the skulls to kill the bird without breaking the skin. But birds were more than in, in, um, resources, more than food, more than clothing. Birds are immensely powerful beings. Aleuts were animists. Everything in nature has a soul. Um, everything in nature is intelligent and has agency. Um, one um, Indian elder that I heard um, commented that everything out there is more more intelligent than you are and more capable than you are, um, referring to human beings. We're, we're pretty uninspiring critters. Animals, mountains, rocks, wind, and even the objects made by human beings were alive and aware and intelligent. Life for humans consisted of negotiating relationships with these other non-human actors. Um, I mentioned that humans are not the most important or powerful beings in the world. And human well being requires a constant effort on the part of humans to keep things in balance. This is because, unlike animals, non human persons are incapable of acting immorally. So, if something's going wrong in the world, it is invariably a result of human moral failings. Uh, if the world isn't function functioning properly, it's because humans have somehow failed. So humans to keep the balance are constantly negotiating their relationships with the non-human beings that they interact with on a daily basis. This is almost impossible for archeologists to figure out. Um, what you're looking at here is um, kind of a typical excavation area that's been opened up and cleaned off for photos. Um, but as we, we get broken bones, we get broken rocks, we basically get the scraps and detritus people have discarded or lost. But as we dug and analyzed our finds, we found clues about how important birds were. Small birds like rosy finches, crested and whiskered auklets, I mentioned, were killed for their decorative feathers. Uh, in one site, we found a rosy finch buried underneath an upturned stone lamp. The lamp uh, bowl, which is where the oil sat, was turned up upside down over the finch. Um, Clusters of albatross bones, wing bones, um, cached for later use. I was trying to find a photo of um, modification to albatross humerus bones up at the shoulder. Virtually every albatross humerus bone we find has a hole punched through it. No one can explain why there would be holes punched through albatross humerus bones. And we find these things in um, large numbers. Uh, the albatrosses are the uh, short-tailed albatross, um, which are pretty rare, but coming back. Um, this particular picture is in, on the floor of a house. And if you look slightly to the right of center, you'll see kind of a tan spot. That is two planks of whalebone. They're about half an inch thick just flat slabs of whalebone laying on the ground. I wish I had a, a pointer here because I keep pointing at the, the picture, but in the middle of that, you can kind of see a round circle where 
um, a wooden house post sat on those, those planks so it wouldn't sink into the mud. When we removed those two planks underneath, we found a sea otter and an eagle buried together, um, kind of facing each other um, and buried together. The trick is to put all of these hints together to understand what people were thinking. As weak creatures, weak, helpless, and not too bright creatures, humans need help to become killers. Um, as hunters and fishermen, Aleut men were raised to kill things. They had to kill to support their families. So why birds? Birds gave men the power to kill. Birds cross physical and metaphorical boundaries. The Aleut world had three levels, a celestial realm, Earth's surface, and an underworld. The underworld is under the sea. Souls of animals dwell in the underworld and come to the surface to make themselves available to humans. Animals that are killed by humans have offered themselves to the human hunter. Birds, specifically seabirds, cross those boundaries. They nest on land, they fly through the air, and they swim underwater. They're messengers. I picked Whiskered Ocklets as the hero of the story because what's not to love about this face? Um, but all seabirds are players. These were the most common birds used for men's parkas, tufted and horned puffins, common murres, pigeon guillemots, loons, and pelagic cormorants. It takes a lot of bird skins to make a, pa a parka. It took 40 tufted puffins or 50 murres or 60 horned puffins for a parka, and a man needed a new parka about every year. It was a rugged life. Cormorants with that iridescent plumage were reserved for festival dress. It would have been fantastic to see a man moving around or dancing with that shimmering iridescent feathers um, as part of his costume. You'll notice most of the birds used for clothing were black and white. Through birds, through wearing the skins of birds, men could become the ultimate predators. They became uh, basically killer whales. In other parts of Alaska, killer whales have been seen coming out on land and becoming wolves, or packs of wolves have entered the ocean and become killer whales. The, the theme is constantly transformation from one state to the other, from one um, physical or spiritual state into one that is either more powerful or more normal. Um, one thing to remember is that none of this is supernatural. The Aleuts didn't have a concept of supernatural. All of this was completely normal and um, could be experienced by anyone. So it's not magic. It is uh, these are states that any human being can, can cross with the proper preparation. Killing animals meant life. Human men solicited the help of birds to obtain the power to kill, but killing also brought life. Animals fed human beings. They clothed human beings. You couldn't live without humans, without killing things. And actually killing the animals allowed them to be reborn so that they could come back to be hunted again. So killing and regeneration are two aspects of the same thing. And this is pretty obvious in the figurine on the right where his um, his genitals are actually a bird's beak. And you can see the eye where his navel would be and then, um, and then the beak. The, the beak is a killing tool. It's also a tool of regeneration. Properly respected animals didn't die and disappear. Their souls were reborn. Hunters had to treat the animals with respect and meat 
physical obligations. Marine mammals were given drinks of fresh water. Um, the ritual cycle in the winter was designed, they would invite the animals into the villages during these ceremonies, honor them with feasts and dancing. And then at the end of the ceremonial cycle, they would put the animals' um, bladders back into the ocean. They would travel to the underworld, undersea, and, and be reborn. The, uh, the moon god, and we'll talk about the moon god later, um, lives on and embodies the moon. He's, he lives there, but he is also the moon. He held and released the souls of animals to be reborn. The full moon is, is a bag of souls ready to be reborn, uh, ready to be emptied out onto the earth. And the new moon is the empty bag um, waiting to be refilled. Most of the Aleut specific information on their spiritual beliefs comes from a collection of folklore made in 1909. Uh, Russian anthropologist traveled to the Aleutians. He had recording equipment and he recorded these stories on wax cylinders. They've been um, transcribed and translated and published in this, I think it's a 700 page book. Many of the stories are found in several versions. Um, these stories, because they've never been edited to be understandable to um, non aleut audiences, are um, almost impossible. They're very murky. They're, there's not a clear story. There's not a clear message. Um, and even modern Aleuts have a hard time understanding the messages in these stories because various disruptions in their culture have severed them from the assumptions that once everyone knew. So when they're talking about a bird or when they're talking about a specific action that a person is undertaking, the meaning of that was once evident to everybody and it's no longer. Um, that's no longer the case. So a lot of details in the stories make absolutely no sense. Uh, birds are common in these stories, but they're rarely the main characters. And for a long time, I thought they were just minor, it, kind of an odd toss it in, doesn't really make sense. Um, but it turns out that they, uh, they're really central to understanding the spiritual lives of the Aleuts. Um, I have to, don't suppose any of you are real squeamish, but these stories are, are raw, um, violent and explicit. Uh, I once tried to identify some of these stories to use in a curriculum for high school students um, and failed miserably because I, I couldn't find any that weren't just appalling on some level. So that brings me to my, my first story, um, A Small Bird. I found 12 stories um, with, with variants with small birds as characters. They're usually Rosie Finch, Song Sparrow, and Winter Wren. Um, and I don't know if you know this, but the song sparrows in the Western Aleutians are the largest in the world. And that little guy down there on the bottom is the size of a, a robin. They're huge. Um, and they're very bold. With size comes boldness. So this story illustrates the problem with unstated assumptions. Sparrow and Winter Wren are best friends. One day while walking on the beach, they find a dead whale, a bonanza of food and oil. Wren leaps into the blowhole and begins to eat. He gorges and gorges. He's there for a long time eating and eating and he gets stuck and he can't get out. Sparrow grabs onto his arm and pulls off a wing. Wren still can't get out. So Sparrow grabs the other wing and pulls and pulls the wing off again. Then he grabs Winter Wren's head and pulls and the Wren dies. That's the story, and I have no idea what this thing means, but there's got to be something to it. I hope. 
In most of the other stories, birds are more clearly helpers or heroes. There are nine ver versions of this story, one of my favorite strange stories. A man with two wives spends more and more time hunting and one day fails to return home. Comes home later and later every night and then one night he just doesn't come home. The two women mourn. Without a, without a husband, without a hunter to bring food home, they're plunged into uh, poverty and destitution. They, they have no means of acquiring what they need to live. One day, one of the women is out harvesting grass and Song Sparrow follows her and tells her he knows where her husband is. She goes home and tells the co-wife that their husband is still alive. The next day, the co-wife is out working and the sparrow follows her and says the same thing. I know where your husband is. Their husband was now living with another woman in the next bay. Women walk over the hills to the bay and see a house with another woman and the, their husband is in the bay fishing in his kayak. The wives enter the house. The woman, who has only one eye, um, invites them to eat hot soup, but has no spoons. They ask how they can eat with no spoons, and she demonstrates by leaning over to drink out of the, the boiling pot. The jilted wives push her head into the boiling soup and kill her. They then arrange her body outside the house as if she's waiting for the husband to come back. The husband eventually comes home, walks up the hill, greets, greets the woman, realizes she de she's dead, and then sees his ex-wives. He runs. They catch and kill him. In one version, the wives turn into bears and tear him apart. This story is widespread throughout Alaska. Um, and again, it's an odd, odd, uh, what is the point of this thing? I've summarized only two of the 12 stories with small birds. They all share some themes that demonstrate the power of even tiny birds. One is to confer the power to kill. Like the seabirds with the hunters, birds, even a, a winter wren, can give humans the power to kill. The other second power is control over fire and heat. Birds allow communication with spirits called Kugar and Unangan and translated as demon. They're not demons, they are spirits of non-human persons. Finally, humans transform humans into other shapes or transform them into other spiritual states. This brings us to Thunderbird, a god found almost everywhere in North America. In some areas, Thunderbird is associated with thunder, lightning, and bringing and life-bringing rain. In Alaska, Tingmiakpak, giant eagle, is associated with hunting, killing, and regeneration. In 2020, Yupik Eskimos in Southwest Alaska reported sighting a Ting Miakpak, the giant eagle. They had not been seen in decades, but one had now dramatically appeared. The bird was eventually seen by biologists who, who called it a stellar sea eagle. One of the first years I worked in Alaska, actually it was about 1990, I was on Attu Island and hiking across um, a saddle between two valleys and um, this enormous bird came up the valley toward me. It was the biggest bird I've ever seen. And it was a stellar sea eagle. Um, amazing, I didn't know that at the time. It was an amazing sight. This Ting Miakpak um, that was seen in Southwest Alaska in 2020 flew across the US and is actually currently in Maine hanging out with bald eagles. Um, I don't know if any of you have seen this guy. Um, if you haven't seen it, um, it's well worth a pilgrimage to go up and try and catch a glimpse of this bird. Um, it's a, an amazing sight. And they are big. He's hanging out with bald eagles and I suspect they look like chicks to this bird. 
Aleuts don't seem to have a word for Thunderbird, but call the giant whale-eating deity Big Raven Kaglamiyax. In Northwestern North, North America, Raven is a god. He's a creator and a destroyer, a lawgiver and a bandit. A bandit. He's magnificent and he's foul and disgusting. Here, Raven liberates humanity from a clam he found on the beach. He is magnificent, intelligent, powerful, and a complete idiot. There are only a few Raven stories from the Aleutians, and they're from the far western islands, um, which is where I saw the, the sea eagle. The term big, as in big raven, to describe an animal in Aleut uh, means that this is the very embodiment of that creature. So Big Raven is the ultimate raven. He, there's one Big Raven and he's the, the, they call him the chief or the, the boss um, raven, but he is the ultimate raven, the platonic ideal of a raven. Now the story about Big Raven begins with a young human man entering adulthood. His mother's brother has trained him for manhood and he is now heading out to prove himself. His uncle puts him inside a, a log and puts the log on a beach. Eventually, Big Raven flies over and spots the log. She, and the story is explicit that it's a she, knows there's something unusual about the log. She examines it, rolls it over, and carries it to her nest where there are four young ravens. And on the right, you see the, the um, raven's nest, which is the crater of a volcano. That night, the young man leaves the log and enters a cave filled with spirits. He gives a drink of fresh water to the spirits, and, he had, and they provide him with advice on how to overcome Big Raven. Apparently his quest is to overcome Big Raven. He returns to the log. The next day, the raven and her spouse leave to hunt whales. Our hero kills the youngest and favorite child of the ravens and puts on the, the baby raven skin, becoming the young raven. The raven parents return with a whale and feed the young. That night, as Big Raven slept, the young man clubbed her and threw her lifeless body into a ravine where it rumbled and smoked. The male raven found his dead spouse in the morning and his eyes flashed lightning and his wings beat thunder. He tried to catch the man who had killed his spouse, but the young man escaped into his whiskered auklet guise. The male raven fled east to a cave. The man followed as an auklet. When he reached the cave, the spirits living inside the cave refused the raven entry, and the man was able to capture the raven, and holding him over a fire reduced him to the modern-sized raven. Again, fire, transformation, and the power to the kill, and the power to kill. Um, this final story, um, I think, starts to pull all these things together. This story has no birds in it. Um, when Aleut girls reach puberty and had their first menstrual menstruation, they were isolated from society for 40 days. Um, I've often thought that my parents at least would have thought this was a great way to deal with a teenage kid. Um, during subsequent periods, the isolation lasted 10 days. The parents were not involved with the um, daughter's care during this time. She was given food by an aunt or her grandmother. Um, they could not, during their isolation, the girls could not process meat or cook, but they could weave or sew. And I believe they were probably harangued by auntie or grandma about their duties as a, a wife and a mother and a, and a woman in their society. One young woman was visited during her isolation by a mysterious suitor. This is totally a violation of every social norm. Um, the young man came every night, did not speak, and left before dawn. 
As her period of isolation ended, she decided to expose this man. As he left her room, she hamstrung him. When she emerged into daylight the next morning, the village was in mourning and she found her suitor dying of his wound. The man was her brother. She approached him, exposed her breasts, leaned over, breathed on him, cut off one of her breasts, threw it on him, danced back and brought him to life. He rose from his bed and chased after her. She ran to the edge of a cliff and leaped off. He followed. They hit the water and resurfaced as sea otters. And there's a, a pair of sea otters there at the bottom. Now, the, this is a story that's known, is widespread in Alaska, uh, North Alaska especially. Um, and the cutting off the breast and the blood there is the color of the sunrise in the morning. Again, we have fire. In North Alaska, the incestuous couple um, flee into the sky and the brother becomes the moon and the sister becomes the sun. The brother safeguards as the moon safeguards and holds animals' souls until they are reborn. They hang out on the moon. The um, celestial sphere is actually quite nice. It's warm. It's sunny. The weather's never bad. Um, there's lots of water. There's grass. It's a very pleasant place. But, but the, the souls that are held there are waiting to be reborn. The son, the woman, the sister, is actually the judge. She is the powerful deity. She decides whether or not the hunter who killed the animal um, or the bird or the fish properly respected the animal, showed the, the proper respect. If the hunter was respectful, she allowed the animal to be reborn. If the hunter was not respectful, the animal's soul becomes a ghost, um, an actual demon, and its goal in life is to bring disease and misfortune to the misbehaving human beings. She manifests herself to humans as the sun, as big raven or thunderbird, and as a volcano. She's judgmental, um, volatile, um, kind of unpleasant. She likes to kill things. She's um, cranky and oddly, for a deity and for humans, the way to address her behaviors is to um, aggressively come back at her. And the woman with one eye in in that first in that second story was this sun woman. And to bring her back into harmony to make the world right, the two women killed her. There's another story, a uh, summer-faced woman, where she's hanging out on a beach and killing anybody who comes by. And a young man uh, confronts her and outsmarts her and outtricks her. And eventually he throws her off a cliff and kills her. Um, that's an odd way to relate to a god, but um, it is a way human beings have of... Um, helping to restore a balance that has been knocked badly out of uh, whack by, again, human misbehavior. Birds um, of all kinds are this deity's messengers. They're her agents and they report to her. They, they tattle, basically, little, little bird told me uh, on human misbehavior, but they also provide human assistance to navigate her whims. Um, the whole basis of the relationship between humans, animals, birds, the sea otter, um, even the volcanoes is based on respect and reciprocity. Life is a constant 
negotiation of relationships and building connections and bridges. And I probably blazed through that way too fast and we have lots of time for questions, maybe. Uh, we, uh, uh, I don't think there are any questions uh, that have come up in the Q and A, but um, certainly uh, we're open to those. But I do have one question that um, that uh, I've always, I've, I've often wondered about with the native people and, and birds is what was their interpretation of bird migration? I mean, for these birds to disappear you know, completely for a long period of time and then and then reappear. Uh, I mean, I, I doubt they were aware of the, um, you know, these birds moving to the south for for uh, for food and for um, better conditions in the winter. So what what would have been their explanation for bird migration? Do you have any idea of that? I don't, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of the animals here migrate, um, you know, caribou migrate north and south to feeding grounds, wintering grounds and breeding grounds. Um, salmon uh, leave and come back. Um, so I, as I don't know that specifically. Um, it, that's a good question. Um, I suspect they just, realized that was just a cycle and that the the animals the animals could leave any time and actually if hunters weren't respectful animals could leave and just disappear um but the the cycles um with the winter festivals successfully completed things would come back with light and warmth in the summer Mm -hmm. So I know that um, in the Yukon Delta, the um, the Yupik people, of course, now are very well, well aware of where the birds, the uh, waterfowl, ducks and geese go, um, and they interpret those migrations and population declines and population increases um, not to uh, Western science management, but to the birds making decisions about how they're going to um, interact with people. Mm -hmm. I had a question um, when you were talking about the resources on that on these islands um, mm -hmm. and things that were used for decorations and things that were used for foods. Um, you didn't know, mention anything about mollusks or crustaceans or things like that. Were they more scarce in that? No, no, they were actually um, a large proportion of the volume of the archaeological sites in the Aleutians are made up of um, sea urchin shells. Oh, um, up to 40% of the volume is sea urchin shells. And wow. they were, um, shellfish was, it's considered a famine food um, that, you know, people wouldn't ordinarily eat um, unless they were hungry. But again, it's, it's something that's always available. They're always there. They're easy to get. Women, kids, um, old people could go down and, and forage basketfuls of sea urchins and um, limpets. Okay. Uh, they call them bedarkies, gumshoes, um, chitons. They're chitons. Um, they're, they're easy to catch and they're plentiful. And I suspect people just would get baskets of these things and sit on the beach and eat shellfish. Wow. Well. We eat shellfish because we like the way they taste. <laughs> they did too. <laughs> well, that was that was definitely very very interesting. Um, the stories, I have to say, made me chuckle a little bit. They were pretty out there. 
They are pretty out there. Yeah, there are some, uh, yeah, I had a hard time. I mean, how do you yeah. have, I mean, the Aleut High School kids probably reading these stories, but you set up a lesson. How do you talk about, you know, cold-blooded murder and then, you know, tearing someone apart? And yeah, uh, it's just... Yeah, uh, the stories made absolutely no sense to me when I first started reading them and with an enormous amount of work and comparing with stories from other parts of Alaska and um, reading about Eskimo religion elsewhere, some of them are starting to make more sense. My dream is to figure out why Sparrow ripped the arms off of his buddy Wren. <laughs> what was the point of that? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think if there's no further questions, um, we will say our thank yous to you, Deborah, coming to us today from Alaska. Um, what time is it there, by the way? It is four o'clock, okay. four thirty, four twenty, <laughs> four twenty. And how many hours of daylight do you have? It is actually still light now, but it's starting to get dark. So I think we're. It gets dark by about seven thirty. We have about ten hours of daylight right now. Okay. Yeah, well, big improvement over December when we had about five. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> But well, we definitely been... appreciate you coming around and uh, being with us this evening. And it, it was very interesting. Um, we do have a couple of thank yous coming in um, from people in the audience. Um, appreciate your time and your energy and your willingness to put that together for us. Well, you're very welcome. And I'm dying to know if anyone has seen that eagle. I, I think we did have a couple people who were in that area around the time that it was being sighted, um, mm -hmm. but I'm not a hundred percent sure. I know we. I was watching some Facebook traffic go back and forth mm -hmm. about it. I uh, I looked I looked it up um, just this last week, and apparently it has been sighted this month um, up up in Maine somewhere. So. There's nice. still a maybe an opportunity. But yeah, I'm sure it's a news story. Um, so somebody hit us where in Maine. I'm, I'm sure if you just do a search for stellar sea eagle in Maine, you may find something like within the last week on where it had been sighted. Yep. Um, yeah. The Staley. I'm hoping that comes say down thank to you. Uh, Long Staley, Island. Yeah, the Staley say specifically thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, this <laughs> David's the one that contacted me about these presentations. Yep. So he he was on ADAC uh, with me in 1983 as well. Love it. Thrown out there together to uh, die in the North Pacific. <laughs> <laughs> you well, I just remember um, the presentation from last year. Was it? where we had the presentation on the Bering Sea bird life and mm -hmm. yes, talking about talking. how yeah. like they're out in these little, you know, skiffs. Yes. <laughs> and yes. there's no rescue services. There's nothing around if anything went wrong. That's a little exactly. Yeah. Well, um, you can fly to ADAC, but from there it's a boat to get to anywhere else. And when the, when the uh, research vessel steams off into the sunset and you're on your beach with your tent, you're you're there. Yeah, it's a completely um, foreign way of life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm getting a little too old for it now. I, I think back on it with a certain amount of fondness and excitement and I'm so glad I did it, but the, thought of sleeping in a tent on the damp ground lost its charms quite some time ago, actually. <laughs> well, thank you again, Deborah. We appreciate it. Thank you uh, very much. Oh, you're very welcome. And uh, thank you for inviting me. It's been a pleasure. Take care. <laughs>